Hey kids, it's Pastor Pete, and I uh, want to take this opportunity to greet you and welcome you to another uh, Saturday morning uh, church online, and I hope that you've been enjoying these, uh, these special uh, services that have been uh, made possible through some of the incredible children's workers here at the Cleveland Baptist Church. I'm standing in front of one of the coolest pictures in my office. This is course the uh, the painting of Daniel and the lion's den and you can see Daniel there just over my shoulder and uh, what an incredible story that is of God's amazing grace and of course we're in need of some of his grace today and uh, we're, we're, uh, we're certainly trusting him just as God delivered Daniel uh, from the mouth of the lion that God will deliver us during our time of difficulty and trouble as well I want you to know we miss you miss you so much and we cannot wait until uh, our children are back in church. I'm going to buy lots of candy and have lots of candy to give away uh, because we've gone a lot of weeks without it. Of course, tomorrow is Easter, and I certainly want to wish you and your family a very happy Easter. We want to encourage you to encourage your parents to, to bring you along to the Easter drive-in service we'll be holding out in our parking lot. I want you to pray, uh, children, if you would, that God would give us good weather. It uh, won't, won't matter a whole lot for us to have bad weather for you because you'll be in your vehicles but I don't want to get rained on or snowed on or any other, uh, any other things that might happen uh, here in spring in Northeast Ohio. So again, we're so glad that you've decided to tune in and join us today. We've got a lot of special things planned. Uh, there will be a mystery reader uh, of the Alice and Bible Land stories, and we want you to do your best to guess who that mystery reader is. And uh, if you'll just comment below who you think that is, uh, that would be great. And we'll see who's the first to get it. Of course, Mrs. Brown will be telling another one of her incredible stories. I think you'll enjoy that. And Brother Dustin, for another week, has been so faithful to uh, provide a Bible message for us. God always uses him in a great way. So listen, kids, thanks so much for tuning in. And uh, very soon, again, we're praying that we're going to be able to be back together again as we normally have been. And what a wonderful day that's going to be. Hey, listen, we love you. We're praying for you. We miss you. And we pray and trust that God gives you and your family a very, very happy Easter. Thanks for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great weekend. The Story of Easter A little girl named Alice was so happy it was spring. She loved to see the flowers and to hear the robins sing. Alice sat down in her garden underneath some budding trees. Her favorite Bible storybook was propped up on her knees. She chose to read of Easter, which was just five days away. And as she read, the airmail bird brought this note her way. Reading is the special key to take you where you want to be. The Bible storybook she read became a giant screen. She walked on through to Bible land and came upon this scene. This early Sunday morning, just they saw the stone that sealed his tomb had been rolled away. Inside, the tomb was empty. The women feared to stay. One woman, Mary Magdalene, ran off to tell two others, John and Peter. Jesus' friends, whom he treated as dear brothers. All three ran back to the tomb. Peter, then John too, found that the tomb was empty. What Mary said was true. Although the tomb was empty, John and Peter found cloth, which had wrapped Jesus, lying on the ground. Feeling scared and puzzled, John and Peter left the tomb. Mary stood outside and wept. Her heart was filled with gloom. She looked inside the half-lit tomb and saw two angels near. They asked, why are you weeping? She replied, my Lord's not here. A man who stood behind her asked why she wept still more. Then gently he asked Mary whom she was looking for. Mary didn't see the man. The light was very dim. She thought he was a gardener. And so she said to him, if you know where they've taken him, please, please do let me know. Wherever they have taken him, that's where I want to go. The man just answered Mary. All at once she knew his voice. Mary knew the man was Jesus, and she felt her heart rejoice. Mary cried out, Master, and quickly turned around. Lovingly, she kissed his feet as she knelt upon the ground. Jesus said to Mary that she should go and tell his loving friends and followers that he was alive and well. I'm going to my God, my Father, who is your God and Father too. And even though I'll be with him, I'll always be with you. Mary ran and told his friends that Jesus was not dead but they were much too doubtful to believe anything she said. His followers were frightened and so that very night they secretly met inside a room and locked the door real tight. They feared the foes of Jesus and felt they had to hide. Then suddenly one noticed Jesus standing by his side. His friends thought Jesus was a ghost. He sensed their frightened mood 
and then to prove he was alive, Jesus asked for food. When they saw Jesus eating, they rejoiced for then they knew that he was truly risen. What Mary said was true. Jesus said that soon he'd send the Holy Spirit to them to help them share the happy news that Jesus lives again. He said they all should preach his teachings every day and they should baptize everyone who follows in his way. The time had come for Alice to leave that Bible scene. She came back home by walking through her very special screen. She took her book inside and thought, there are so many reasons why Easter's such a holy time, the happiest of seasons. On Easter morning, Jesus rose, he was no longer dead and everything had happened in just the way he'd said. He was with his church on that first Easter when he told his friends to share the good news of his teachings with people everywhere. Then Alice thought, I'm glad to be a friend of Jesus too. I'll spread his word and feel him near each day my whole life through. Oliver knew it was time that he had to part with his mother's painting, so he asked Miss Gregory to sit with the twins for a while. He carried his mother's painting in his arms. He was going to go see Mrs. Sutherland. But Mrs. Sutherland wasn't at home. She wasn't going to be back for a week. Oh, disappointed, Oliver turned his steps toward the store where he knew his paintings were on sale. 
The shopkeeper told Oliver that the painting was worth more than he could afford, but Oliver said he had to have money right away and was willing to take whatever he could give him. Well, if I sell it for more than I can, then I'll give you more. Well, at bedtime that night, Oliver and the girls had their quiet time. They understood now what it meant to say, Our Father, which art in heaven. They knew that God was their Father who cared for them and was willing to take care of them. Well, when Miss Gregory found out that the twins needed a new place to live, she had a suggestion. You know, I have a friend who lives a little way outside the city. Uh, her husband used to be a gardener for a big house out there. When he died, they let her stay on at the big garden house, and she would love to have the company. Oliver thought about it, and he said, Well, it would be good to live in the country again. Oh, I wouldn't mind traveling the extra distance to come back in into town to work. Would you be willing to ask your friend if we could talk to her about her rooms? Well, she came back, and she said she was willing to see them, and so he took his little sisters out to meet the new lady. The cottage was small, but the gardener's wife said they could have a tiny room for the girls if Oliver was willing to sleep in a big chair that opened up into a single bed. Oliver was grateful for this answer to prayer, and the twins were so excited to be able to play out in the woods. The night before they were going to leave their old house, Miss Gregory came to their rooms, and she had two beautiful hand-knit dresses for the girls. They were so excited. We're rich! First new coats and now new dresses. Oh, there are lots of kind people in the world, Oliver said. Thank you so much, Miss Gregory. Well, Oliver was a little worried, though, with when they moved, that the girls weren't going to be able to continue their schooling. But Miss Gregory said, um, the road from your new house to your job goes right by my house. Why don't you bring the girls with you when you come to work, and then when we're finished with their schooling, I can send them back and put them on the road. Oh, Oliver was so excited, but he knew it was God who was answering his prayer and showing them the way. Well, the gardener's cottage where they were living was almost just like the little cottage where they had lived with their mother. In the little girl's room, there was just one window, but it faced toward the woods, and the girls loved to look out that window. We might see foxes creeping down through the woods, and little bunnies, too. Oh, but when it's dark, there might be robbers hiding there. Oh, it would be fun to see them creeping under the trees. Oh, I don't know, Debbie said. I'd rather see fairies dancing. Oh, we're going to play there every afternoon when the weather is nice. Well, Oliver turned to their new landlady and he said, Would it be trespassing if we walked in the woods before dark? Oh, no. The family that lives in the big house is away. Um, if you meet anybody from that house, just tell them that you're staying at my house and everything will be fine. So Oliver and the girls climbed up the hill and they could see for miles away in every direction. Well, the sun began to set, and it changed to a beautiful lemon color. Then it was streaked with gray, and slowly it turned to a soft pink. Oh, what beautiful sunsets I'll be able to paint from here. I might even be able to sell some of my money for my paintings for a good price. So they turned to walk back toward the cottage. Oliver noticed two fat little faces looking at them from the bushes. Hello, Oliver said. Who are you, please? The owners of the fat little faces, a boy and a girl, didn't answer Oliver. Instead, they made ugly faces at him and the twins, and then they turned and ran down the hill. Then they turned back when they got to the bottom, and they made fun of Oliver. Hello, who are you, please? Oh, who are you? We don't want to know who you are. You're on our property and we want you to go home. And then they turned around and ran away. I wonder who those mean kids are, Bab said. They might belong to one of the servants at the big house. Just ignore them and they'll leave you alone. 
Well, that night during their prayer time together, they ended their individual prayers by repeating the Lord's Prayer. When they got to the part, give us this day our daily bread, Oliver stopped them. He said, you know, girls, when we get to this part, we need to really mean it when we pray it. Well, why, Oliver? Well, because we need to make sure that we're going to have enough money to hold out. And we have to ask God with all of our hearts to give it to us. He's never failed us yet. But things are pretty tight. I want you to pray often for God to give us this day our daily bread. Well, they finished their prayer and they began talking and Bab said, Oliver, do you think that Jesus prayed to give us this day our daily bread because he and his disciples were starving and hungry? Well, they were hungry sometimes, I'm sure, Oliver said. And I know that we're going to be taken care of. But we must pray because Jesus told us to. Well, the next Saturday, the landlady took Oliver and the girls all through the gardens that belonged to the owner of the big house. They saw hot houses and water and rock gardens and a rose garden and beautiful terraces. The best part, though, was when she showed them the children's garden. It had a swing and a tiny summer house and low seats. And right in the middle of the garden was a pigeon house. They saw some rabbit hutches and a squirrel's cage. And the landlady said, but there's no children living in the big house now. Um, So nobody really takes care of it. Well, they looked over to the side and there were those two fat faces looking out from the bushes, making faces at them. The landlady looked at them and she said, those are the cook's children. They're mean. Don't pay any attention to them. When they got back to the cottage, There was a visitor waiting for them. It was Mrs. Sutherland. Oh, she was so disappointed that Oliver had sold that painting to somebody else. But she said she had some good news. A friend of hers was a banker and he needed a clerk and she recommended Oliver for the job. Oliver, it's going to pay you twice as much as you're getting now. That night, Oliver thanked God for supplying their daily bread. And within a week, Oliver was working at the bank. Well, after Oliver started working at the bank, one day it was really rainy and the girls were getting restless. Oliver told the landlady that he was going to be away and she said, well, I'm going to be away too. Oh no, what was he going to do with those girls? Were they going to get in trouble like they did the last time? Well, before Oliver left for work, he said, I don't want you in my room today for anything. Do you understand me? Not for anything. Why? Well, it would be nice to think that you would obey without knowing all the reasons. But I'll tell you, this morning I put a painting together. And because it was so wet outside, the sketch is still a little bit wet. And I don't want anything to happen to it. I have somebody who's ordered it, and they're going to pay a very good price for it. Well, that was enough for the twins. Oliver left for work, and so the twins began playing in their tiny little room. They were running around and playing, but, you know, the room seemed so small. So they started to run in some of the other rooms in the cottage. They were going up and down the stairs, and they ran around in the kitchen. And before long, they had forgot what Oliver said. Babs ran into Oliver's room. She jumped over the bed. She grabbed a pillow, and she threw it at Debbie. It landed on the dresser where Oliver's sketch was. Oh, look, the sun came out, Babs yelled as she opened the window to look out. Neither girl saw that Oliver's sketch slid slowly down and blew out the window. Because the sun was out, they went out to their little garden. They pulled weeds until they were tired, and they said, Ugh, these weeds are trying to choke out our flowers. They didn't notice those fat little faces looking at them as they worked. Let's go back to the house and clean off some of this mud before the landlady gets back. Well, as they got back to the house, they found Oliver's sketch. It was under one of the bushes. (gasps) We forgot to close the window, Debbie said. Babs picked up the sketch and she tried to wipe it off on her dress. 
All that did was smear the paint, and now the painting was smeared, and there was paint on her dress. Now what are we going to do, Debbie said. We're going to take it to the fire and dry it off. But as they did before, they held the sketch too close to the fire, and it scorched a spot in one corner. Oh, we're always doing something wrong, said Debbie. Uh, Let's don't tell Oliver anything about it. It's all your fault, Babs. You're the one to open the door and go into Oliver's room first. You're the one that opened the window. Well, you came in too. You're just as bad as I am. Come on, let's hide it behind the bushes and we'll let Oliver find it for himself. When Oliver came home, the girls lied to him just like they planned. I can't trust you, Oliver said. You promised you wouldn't go in the room and you did. Now I wonder if you're going to tell me the truth. You don't look like you're telling me the truth. Um, maybe the sketch blew out the window. The window was open when we got there. No, it wasn't. I left the window closed so my sketch would dry. You opened it, didn't you? And the sketch blew out. Oh, the girls were so much trouble. Oliver just wished that he had his mother with him. She would know how to handle things like this. That very day, the man in the shop called him and gave him more money for his mother's painting. How the gentleman who was interested in the picture had paid a good price for it. Oh, the shopkeeper wanted Oliver's paintings to sell. Now it was another disappointment. That night, as they were working in their notebooks, the girls told Oliver the whole truth of what had happened to his sketch. Please, Oliver, forgive us. We didn't mean to ruin your sketch, and we're sorry, aren't we, Babs? Babs choked back a sob. Please forgive us, but I have to tell you it was really all my fault. If you can't forgive both of us, please forgive Debbie. I know you can't forgive both of us. Oliver felt a lump in his throat. He loved his little sisters. Of course I forgive both of you, but I am disappointed. Doing something wrong is bad enough. But then you lied about it, and that made it even worse. If only you had told me the truth right away. Oh, Oliver, we'll never be so wicked again. Well, I do forgive you, but it's more important that you ask God to forgive you. So the two little girls bowed their heads that night, and they learned what it meant to say, and forgive us our trespasses, or our debts, or our wrongs, or our sins. But the next day, the girls learned what it meant to say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. You see, the girls were out in their garden, and something terrible had happened. Oliver came home, and both of the girls were just sobbing. Well, now what happened? Please don't tell me you've been bad again. Not us, Oliver. We were as good as can be. Come and look and see what those cook's children did to our garden. They walked out to the garden, and all the flowers had been pulled up by their roots. Everything was ruined. As they stood there looking at the garden, those two fat faces appeared in the bushes. We told you we didn't want you here. We don't like you, and we don't like your garden. And we're going to smash it every time you make it. So there, the cook's children made those awful faces, and Oliver and the girls ran up the hill. Go after them, Oliver. Go after them and smash their fat little faces for them. We hate them. Yes, Debbie screamed. We hate you. We hate you. Oliver stopped, and he took the girls by their hands, and he took them back to the cottage. Oh, he had so much he had to teach these girls. That night, he said, you know, yesterday you found out what it meant to say, forgive us our trespasses. Now it's time that you learn what it means to say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. You wanted me to forgive you when my sketch was destroyed. Now you have to be willing to forgive those children who destroyed your garden. Next week, we'll find out if they're able to do that and what happens to the garden.
Hello and welcome to the third edition of Quarantine Junior Church. My name is Mr. Brady. I'd like to start, as always, with an update on my beard. I would like to say that my beard peaked uh, last week sometime, and now it is a real downward spiral. Um, it's getting real scraggly here, and turns out, nothing over here, nothing over here. I might take a marker to it next week. You'll just have to find out. So I'd like to start out by saying Happy Easter Eve. Uh, today it's a very special day. I don't know if you have any traditions that you do with your family um, around this time. Um, for me, Mrs. Brady's uh, mom and dad would always have us over every Easter Eve to uh, color Easter eggs and do an Easter egg hunt, which is very, very cool, very special when you have little kids. It's fun to watch them run around. Uh, turns out it is less cool and less special to do it without kids, um, but that is uh, what we would do every year. They would always have us over and I would look at Mrs. Brady while we're driving like, do I have to go? I am a 30 year old man. And she says, yes, you have to go and you'll have fun. And um, I would be looking for Easter eggs and I would open them up and, and Mrs. Brady's mom would always put in Reese's eggs for me because she knows I like them and I did have fun. Um, but I was looking forward to tomorrow and of course we can't do it because of the virus and um, we've had a little bit of sickness in our house so we're being extra careful. And it's been a bummer, right? It's been a bummer. I'm, I'm guessing it's been a bummer for you, um, even if you know you don't know if somebody's gotten sick or, or had your life seriously affected by it, but it's a bummer for everyone. Um, just uh, the other day, my daughter, Layla, um, looked at me and she said, Daddy, I want to pet dogs again. I said, I know, Layla. She says, I want to pet cute dogs. And even if you're Layla, even if you're three years old and she doesn't even know hardly anything's going on, but she knows that she's bummed out because she wants to pet dogs. And I would say everyone in the whole world right now is, is scared, is bummed out, and they're locked in their houses because of that. And I think that because of that, that makes this Easter Eve almost exactly like the one 2,000 years ago, the very first Easter Eve. You see, I, I'm thinking about the disciples, right? And the disciples on this day were locked in a house and they were scared, just like everybody here, right? And Because from their perspective, they were following Jesus and they were really excited. Things were starting to pick up. Um, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, they had just had a big parade for Jesus. People were putting their coats on the ground and the donkey was walking over it and everybody was praising him and, and yelling. It. And it was, things were picking up. It was amazing. And then all of a sudden, just like that, Jesus was gone. So they were scared, they were afraid, and we're going to see what happens um, in John chapter 20. Because we don't celebrate today, right? We don't celebrate Easter Eve. That's a weird thing to say to somebody. Um, we celebrate tomorrow. The story doesn't end today. The story doesn't end on Saturday. The story ends on uh, Sunday. So if we look, this is um, on Sunday in John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And at that day, at that moment, the disciples' lives changed forever. They went from being scared, from being fearful, to being courageous. When we read about the disciples and Acts and going forward, they are not scared of anything. They march forward because they know that Jesus is with them. And when they saw Jesus, it changed everything. And I thought today, wouldn't it be cool if we could see Jesus? Now, you're not going to see Jesus, um, you know, physically with your eyes today, but, but Jesus is here, right? Jesus is with us. And a lot of times when we're bummed out or we're scared, it feels like Jesus is very far away. But Jesus can be just as real for us today. We can see Jesus today just as much as the disciples could see them with their eyes that first um, Easter day. And, and I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of times Easter is a day when I feel like I can see Jesus. I'm close to him I'm, it, because it's in church. You know, and we're thinking about the Easter story and we're talking about it in church. Um, and it ends with the big cantata at night. And to me, that's when I feel like I can see Jesus a lot. And I thought, you know what? There are things that we can do when we're feeling bummed out, when we're feeling alone, where we can see Jesus. And I thought there's a good passage that talks about that. Um, it's in Psalm verse 22. And in Psalm 22, is a psalm of David, and it's a psalm, it starts out, I think you'll, you'll um, recognize the first 
verse of this psalm because it's a verse that Jesus quotes when he's on the cross. It says this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Um, and that's, the, that's what Jesus says on the cross, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this is a verse that David wrote not knowing that Jesus would, would say, him 2, years, uh, say him so many years later. He didn't, all these things that he says um, uh, in this verse are things that happened to Jesus. David didn't know that. David, what David knew was that he was going through a hard time was that he was going through a time when it felt like God couldn't hear him, when it, when all his enemies were around him and surrounding him. And, and he felt like this time where he was far away from God. And I see in this psalm three things that David does that I think that if we do, we can see Jesus in our lives today. The first one is in verses 4 and 5. It says this, Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted thee and were not confounded. In these verses, David is remembering what God did for Israel in Egypt and in the wilderness, um, how he delivered them. And I think that is so important because when we feel alone, when we feel like, uh, you know, we're in big trouble, when God is not near to us, it's easy to forget what God has done before. And if we remind ourselves of those things, of things in the Bible, things that God has done for us, you know, stories like David and Goliath of of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of the Easter story, we realize that God is powerful. And that same God that did those things for them can do those things for us. Now, here's the thing. I, I, there's a difference between knowing those things, knowing those facts of those stories, and having those stories be real to us. If you try to tell somebody the plot of your favorite movie or your favorite book, it's going to be boring because you're just telling them the facts of this. And no matter how exciting the, the movie is or how exciting the, the story is, it's going to sound weird and boring because it's just like, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And a lot of times that's how the stories in the Bible can feel to us. Like you guys know the stories in the Bible. You can tell them to me by heart. Um, but a lot of times those stories aren't real to us. So here's what I would encourage you to do, either today or tomorrow, when your family reads the Easter story together. And if your family isn't going to read the Easter story together, um, I would encourage you to, to, to see if you guys can do that. Um, maybe you can read it for yourself. Uh, but when you're reading the Easter story, when you're listening to the Easter story, put yourself in the story. Think about the ways that the, the different people in the story might have felt, the disciples, um, the guards at the tomb, Mary Magdalene, and, and put yourself in the story. And when we do, when we imagine ourselves in the story, when we make the story real, that story then can be real for us. And, and we see that that God is not just you know somebody who we read about in the Bible, but is the same God that can do great things for us. So the, for, the first thing I would say is to remember. Um, the second one I think we can find in a couple verses here in Psalm 22. Um, the first verse uh, I'm going to read is verse number 11. It says this, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Okay, and, and I'm, remember that verse. I'm going to read verse 19. Okay, it says this, Be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. David repeats that word, that phrase, um, Be not far from me. And, and he's over and over again saying things like that in the psalm. He's, he's pleading with God to, to be with him, um, to hear him, to listen to him, to walk with him. And he's seeking God. So that's why I would say the second thing is the first thing is to remember. The second thing is that we need to seek God. Uh, I think a lot of times that God allows trials to come in our lives because he wants us to start seeking him. Um, I, I don't know about you, um, but for me, no matter how much, you know, I, I love God or I want to follow God, if things are going well in my life, a lot of times I just forget. It reminds me of my dog, Nugget. Now, I can't bring Nugget uh, into junior church, unfortunately, because he is a crazy dog and uh, it just wouldn't go well. Um, but we're at my home, Nugget is in my home, so I will um, bring him here if you guys want to see him. So here is my dog, Nugget. Hi, Nugget. This is Nugget. Um, now, Nugget is a nice dog. Nugget loves me, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but Nugget a lot of times forgets me. He shouldn't forget me. I'm the only one who takes him for walks around here. Um, I let him lick me at night. He cuddles with me at night. But most of the time, Nugget forgets about me. Nugget doesn't think about me. I had to go find Nugget around the house. He was um, laying on my pillow, which he usually does. Um, and Nugget isn't the cuddliest dog most of the time. However... When we leave the house to go on vacation, my brother Scott comes, and Nugget loses his mind. 
uh, because Nugget thinks that he has been abandoned. Nugget feels like everybody has forgotten by, about him. And so um, while most days he'll spend all day laying on my pillow, when my brother Scott is here all day, Nugget will um, just be next to him, will be annoying him so much. Scott will send pictures of Nugget perched on top of his head like this. Nugget's not going to perch on top of my head, but Nugget, when Jesse Scott's sitting on the couch, um, Nugget will sit on top of his head. He'll put his head on his keyboard. He will say in his little doggy way, be not far from me, because he doesn't want Scott to leave. He is seeking Scott with all of his heart. You want to go? You want to go back to my bed? Okay. All right, go ahead. Say bye. Okay. Um, but doesn't that happen to us a lot? We say that we're seeking God, but our actions don't match that. Um, we don't seek God truly until we're in trouble. You know, God's not hiding from you. He says that if we seek him, we'll find him. But the problem is a lot of times we're not seeking him. So if you want to see God in your life, if you want God to be real in your life, one of the biggest things that you should do right now is to seek God. To pray to him and not just pray the, the prayer that you might pray every night before bed or um, you know before meals. That's good, but that's not seeking God. Seek God with all your heart. Um, pray specific prayer requests. Watch God answer prayer and watch God be real in your life. That's what it looks like to seek God. And that's what David was doing in this song here. So the last thing that we need to do if we want to see God in our lives, we can find in the second half of this chapter. Now, the first time you read this chapter, it's a little weird. It, it feels almost like somebody smushed two psalms together. Because for the first half, these first verses that we're reading, it's just verse after verse of desperation. And then we see verse number 22, and then it takes a big turn. It says this, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. And, and the first time you read this, and it goes on after that, but the first time you read this, you're like, what happened? Like, did they forget to put a chapter division there? But this verse, these verses take a big turn because the third thing that we need to do if we want to see God is to worship him. And the thing that David does here is he worships God even when his circumstances don't change. You know, you look back at these verses like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, was there a verse about God delivering him? Um, and there's not. But in that end of verse 24, it says this, when he cried unto him, he heard. That God, we can praise God not because he changes our circumstances, not because he suddenly makes everything better, but because he hears us, because he walks with us, because of all the blessings he's given us before, and because he's going to come out victorious in the end. And a lot of times when we're feeling all alone, the thing that we least want to do is worship God. But that's what we need to do first. Because we can think about all the things that God has done for us. You know, when you're feeling sorry for yourself, start thinking about all the blessings that God's given you. You know, you can think about blessings that God gave you weeks ago, months ago, but all the blessings that God has given you today. And when we see that, we see that God is with us this whole time. That God is walking with us this whole time. Um, I think of uh, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Job. In the book of Job, God takes all these things away from Job. His family, um, his house, his, all, all his wealth. And, and at the end of that verse, the end of chapter 1, it's one thing after another, after another, after another. And at the end of chapter 20, at the end of chapter 1, it says this, And Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. For the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that is a beautiful thing to, to think about. You know what? My trust in God isn't based on what he's doing right now, what I see around me, but it's based in who he is. And that no matter what horrible things happen, that God wins in the end. And that's what Easter's all about, right? Jesus raising from the dead, Jesus conquering death, and no matter what happens in my life, I can have peace and I can know that God is real, that Jesus is right here with me because of the Easter story, because Jesus wins in the end. So if you want to see Jesus, if you want Jesus to appear in your life uh, today, tomorrow, just as real as he appeared to the disciples, remember, read the Bible, remember what he's done in the Bible. Number two, seek his face. Seek him like nugget 
seeks after somebody uh, when he thinks that everybody's abandoned him. And the third thing is to praise him, to worship him no matter what, because God is good and God wins in the end. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much uh, for the Easter story, Lord. Thank you for being real uh, in our lives, for real for our disciples, and, and um, for this example that David gives us in, in the scriptures. When we feel at our worst, when we feel down, when we feel depressed, that you're not far from us, but you are walking right next to us every day. Um, I pray that we will see you in a real way in our lives uh, this Easter. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all for paying attention, um, and happy Easter.